Hi everyone, uh, my name's Anna, I'm from the University of Nottingham. This is Adam from the University of Cardiff and this is Peter from the University of Warwick. Uh, we have been working together for around seven months now as analyst interns for the UK government. Um, so, when we first looked at tackling this process, uh, we decided to divide the workload according to our personal skill sets. So, um, I took charge of more project organisation, whereas Adam and Peter did more of the OR analytical techniques involved in this problem. So, uh, the first thing we did was break down the business problem and assess how we convert this into an analytical problem to solve these two questions. Do we predict the variety will be elite and how confident are we in this prediction? We know that success is measured in bags sold, so how can we use the testing data to predict this? Um, Um, after exploring the data generally, uh, we began to see that all the variables provided were related to bags sold, and um, we needed to see whether these, these indicate a whether a variety will be elite or not. Um, we needed to check we were provided with everything in the original data that would predict bags sold. So did we need to collect any further data um, on agricultural or economic factors? For several reasons, we decided not to do this because of resources, and um, we would need to collect and ver verify this data and then Syngenta would have to do this in the future too. Um, we also needed to check if there was any data quality issues such as missing values. Um, when we were looking for missing values, we found the following. Uh, although it's standard procedure for a variety to receive three years of testing, we noticed that not all varieties had all three years of this testing data. So one of the first things we noticed was varieties with three years of testing data had a much higher average amount of bags sold than those with just one or two years of testing data. So when we looked at this in more detail um, for the year we were testing for, which was 2014, we saw 74% of 2014's test varieties were complete, i.e. had all three years of testing. For previous years, this was less than half. So we decided to focus our analy analysis initially on complete varieties only. Um, although this meant we only had 15 commercialized varieties to model on as opposed to 31, we thought this would be a good way to identify predictors in this initial stage, and then we could return to the incomplete, incomplete varieties at a later date which Adam will explain now. So our general plan was to derive as many variables as we could from the data we were provided, and then we could see which ones would allow us to best predict bags sold. So we did this across several statistics. These are just a few examples. So for example, the mean and the rank against other varieties. And then we did this across the analysis variables, so the yield and the relative maturity. And then we did this across the class variables, so experiment location year and class of. So for example, one of the statistics that we calculated was the mean of the yield across an experiment. So when we plotted these predictors against bags sold, we noticed that several of them had linear relationships um, with bags sold. So as the predictor value increased, the bags sold also increased. So this suggested to us that linear regression might be an appropriate technique as it, um, one of the assumptions of linear regression is linear linearity which is that the predictors that you put into the model have to be linearly related with the response variable, so in this case, bag sold. So by doing this, we knew we'd already satisfied one of the assumptions of linear regression if we picked the right predictors. So there's five um, main assumptions of linear regression. The second one, we satisfied lin linearity. And then the second one is independence. So we've assumed that the testing of one variety within an uh, experiment didn't affect the testing of any of the other varieties within the same experiment. So that satisfied the second assumption. So we continued to analyze the 15 predictors that were linearly related to bags sold. Because a lot of these were derived in similar ways, they were very similar to each other and correlated with one another. So this breaks the third assumption of um, linear regression, which is multicollinearity. So when you put the predictors into a linear regression model, um, they can't be correlated with one another. So what we decided to do was group them together where within each group, the variable the predictors were correlated with one, other, one another. So to do this, we used correlation matrices, which allowed us to identify any statistically significant correlations between variables. And once we built the models, we used the variance inflation factor to kind of verify that we had minimal multicollinearity. So by doing this, we allowed we were able to satisfy the assumption of multicollinearity by, when building the models, picking at most one predictor from each group. Um, we wanted to build as many models as possible, 
with as many combinations of the variable predictors as possible. So by picking at most one from each group rather than having all 15, we only had to build. So we picked um, every combination of three variables with at most one from each group, every combination of two, and every model by themselves, every predictor by themselves in a model. This gave us 199 models. If we didn't pick at most one from each group, we'd have had to build 33,000 models, which would have taken a lot more time to process and a lot more time to analyze them and narrow them down once we built them. So the, when we had these 199 models, we started to think about how to narrow them down to the best ones. So the main, the first thing we looked at was the R squared. So it just tells us how well the model we built fits the data. So if the blue line is our regression line generated by our model, as the data points get closer to the line, the R squared will get closer to one. So we use the variation of this called the adjusted R squared, which takes into account um, the amount of predictors that you put into the model as well and penalizes you for adding additional ones. Um, and then the second main statistic we looked at was the press statistic, so the predicted residual error sum of squares. Normally when you build a model, you'd maybe have a training data set and a testing data set, so perhaps you build the model on 70% of the data and see how well it works on the remaining 30% of the data. Because we only had 15 varieties that we were using to build these models, we didn't really want to split it down further and build a model on only 10 varieties. So we used something called take one out cross-validation. So we built, we took one variety out of the 15, we built the model on the remaining 14 and see how well that, how close that model predicts the variety you removed. Um, and then you repeat this for all 15 and the error is essentially the press statistic. So this allows us to tell us how predictive our model is and it worked well because we didn't have that many observations. So then our next step was that we selected all of the models within the top 20% of the adjusted R squared and the press statistic. This left us with 25 models that we could analyze quite rigorously and look at a lot of the plots and see whether they satisfied all of the assumptions of linear regression and uh, we, we were able to look at the regression diagnostics. One of the things that we noticed was when we looked at the Cook's D test, which um, essentially tells us um, if there are any significantly influential varieties within a model um, that bias it. So we noticed that across all 25 of these models, there was two varieties that were influential as above this green line here. Um, th there's two aspects to the Cook's D test which are outliers and um, leverage. So variety three was, was an outlier, so we decided to remove that. And then variety 15 had a really high leverage because it had 1.87 million bags sold compared to the next closest at 1.36 million bags sold. So we, the model was taking this one variety too much into account because it was so it had performed so well. So we decided to cap the bags sold at this at 1.43 million by looking at the average distance between non bags sold. Um, and by doing this, we no longer had any Influential, overly influential varieties. So by removing all of the models that didn't satisfy all the assumptions of linear regression, this gave us two models with two final predictors. The first one was the yield score, which is the average yield across a year of a variety, and the check score scaled, which essentially is a statistic that allows you to compare a variety to the benchmark varieties, which Peter will explain now. So we wanted the least biased comparison of yields um, across different varieties, which meant minimizing the effects of external factors such as uh, weather or sales promotions. Uh, so we tried to group varieties by those which were directly comparable, i.e. Um, we've got the same year, the same experiment, and the same location. So I'll just run through a quick example. We've got three sample varieties um, where in this case variety three is the check variety, the benchmark, and we've got some sample yields as we would have been given in the data set by Syngenta. Now our first step was to rank these yields uh, in order with the worst yields in the experiment and location getting a rank of one. We then divided by the number of varieties in the experiment and location so that we standardized the scores um, to account for different uh, um, numbers of varieties across experiments and locations. So importantly, the, uh, what we called the experiment and location score was always one for the best performing variety. 
We have one more quick example, but this time with a different experiment and a different location. Once again, we rank the yields and we divide by the number. And importantly, this, the score has been standardized. We've got a score of one for the best performing variety. So we then use this to quantify the performance of a variety against the check varieties. So in our example, we want to calculate the check score for variety one. And first step is to simply find the distance between variety one and the check variety score, variety three in this case. We repeat this for all the experiments involving variety one. So once again, uh, variety five is the check in the uh, second experiment. And we see uh, across all the scores, we can average them to get this final, what we call the check score of, in this case, 124th for variety one. Um, so with this predictor, when we inputted it into models, uh, we found that it violated one of the assumptions of linear regression, which is homoscedasticity. Uh, and that being that as we look at the plots of the predicted against the residual, where the residual is the error, the difference between the predicted value and the actual value, we see that the uh, points start to spread out as we go from left to right. That's not what we want. Um, so we came up with a way of rescaling the check scores. And that was uh, essentially by grouping them together um, based on ones that were directly comparable. So firstly, we only selected varieties that were tested with the class of. So for example, if we were calculating the 2014 class of scores, we only consider varieties that were in experiments and locations with, this, with, with the class of 2014 set. And the second step is to rescale those scores between with minus one being the worst score and one being the best score. And this proved effective in, uh, the, we can now see the residual plots are homoscedastic. The error is a lot more constant as we go from left to right. So that was our fourth assumption satisfied. And our fifth and final assumption was the normality of the residual plots, um, which we uh, verified using the graphs and with some statistical tests. Uh, and with that satisfied, we could go on to interpreting the results of these models. So. Um, we've got the all-important one million bag sold line plotted, and this, this first group uh, that we can see in green is the varieties which all models that we used predicted more than one million bags sold. We gave these a high potential and a low risk because they had three years of testing, so we would attribute more consistency to them. Our second group also had three years of testing and was predicted um, at least 0.8 million bags sold by every model. Our third group we call high potential because some models predicted above 0.8, uh, above 1 million bags sold. However, um, in some models we included the variable test year count, um, which pe uh, penalizes uh, a lack of consistency, and uh, so we attribute a high risk. Finally, group four is all the remaining varieties which we wouldn't recommend commercializing. So um, our recommendations would be to only commercialize complete varieties as they are much more consistent in their results. Um, when we were predicting the sales of 2014 varieties, we used models built with check score scaled and yield score and also check score scaled alone. Um, these models gave very similar results. So for the future, we would recommend just using the check score scaled model as it's much easier to calculate and interpret the results of. Um, there were only 15 commercialized varieties to build on uh, this model on, which is quite small. So in the future, we would recalculate the models with updated test year data to improve its accuracy. Um, to implement this, we would derive the check score scaled for all available years, um, remove any influential var varieties using the Cooks D test, and uh, rebuild the model on all years and apply to current potential graduates. Um, so the strength of our solution, um, it's very easily adaptable for future years. You just have to make simple changes to the code. Um, there's no external data required, so that saves the burden of going out and collecting it, saving time, money, and resources. And it's simple to understand, apply, and adapt. Um, thank you very, very much for listening. Have you got any questions?